Hi, I'm Stephen and welcome to Watch Out. This is my first ever attempt to tear down and rebuild a wristwatch watch movement. So I've got this Alexion 15 jewel movement that I got on eBay. And it's a junk movement. As you can see, it's not running at the moment. So um, yeah, it'll be a good movement for me for my very first time to tear down and rebuild. So you can perhaps see that the escape wheel's not turning, so that seems to suggest that power's not getting down the train. So anyway, we'll see what we find when we pull this apart and rebuild it. So as you can see, it didn't come with a case, it's just a movement. So the first thing I need to do is get the hands off, and I'm just using these hand levers that I bought on Amazon to do that. And the plastic is just so I don't scratch up the dial. And so the second hand is, is quite tiny. This is a relatively small movement. I think it is a men's watch. It's not as small as a lady's watch, but it is a fairly small movement. I haven't been able to work out what the movement caliber actually is. It is an Alexion 15 Joule, but um, my Googling didn't help me in finding out what it actually is. If any of you know, you might like to put that down in the comments. So there we go, we've got the hands off. So now the dial needs to come off. A couple of very small dial screws that basically just go into a couple of dial feet that are on the back of the dial. So out come these two screws and then the dial should come free when these are removed. So there we go, it comes off and we've got this little uh, copper washer which pushes between the face and the dial. And look at that! It has actually decided to start running. Isn't that bizarre? I think I saw a little bit of fluff falling out of the movement or something, so that might have just been jammed in the cogs or something, stopping power from getting down the train. So this movement is actually now running, so that's really fantastic. Yeah, so you can quite clearly see at this angle that the escape wheel is indeed turning, which is was not doing before. Right, so the first thing we need to do before we start tearing it down is letting the power out of the mainspring. And so we just hold the ratchet back with the tweezers and I'm just easing the power out um, by holding onto the crown till we get all of the power out of the spring because uh, otherwise bits will just go flying everywhere if you start taking the watch apart with all that power in the mainspring. Okay, so now we'll take off the balance complete. This is the most fragile part of the watch and me being a bit of a klutz there's a good chance that I'll damage it, but anyway, that's why I'm doing this on the junk movement. And I'd say this watch is probably from about the 40s or 50s would be my guess. Let me know in the comments, but you'll see it hasn't got uh, shocks. There's no anti-shock protection in the end stone jewels for the balance. So that's why I think it's a bit earlier. So the hour wheel comes off and now this is the cock for the balance fork, for the, for the pallet fork. So just one screw holding this in. And there's like alignment pins to make sure it goes in the right place, but that sort of like holds it in as well. So there's a slot so that I can just ease the cock out and being very careful not to damage the pivot as I do so. So out comes the pallet fork. And so next is the train wheel bridge.
and again sort of ease that up with a little slot again trying to be careful not to damage the pivots as this comes up and it's free and out it comes so now we'll take the click out so this is the click screw I've got to say I think one thing that's really really important for me in feeling confident enough to actually do this doesn't mean I'll get it right of course but is knowing what the parts are actually called if you if you'd have no idea what a part is then I think it, it's going to make it a whole lot more difficult to put it back together so if you know what a part is then you've got a pretty good idea where it goes so um, that is something that I have learned over the last few months just by you know, watching videos and, and reading things and so on is what the parts are actually called so that's the click spring and to me it kind of looks a little bit mangled I'm just not sure exactly what's going on here and also it doesn't want to come out so I'm just going to leave it in there and so we'll take out the ratchet wheel so this is that wheel that we sort of ease back to let all the power out of the main spring because it attaches to the main spring and this is the crown wheel and it's reverse thread usually they are reverse thread so this one is reverse thread those two screws that we took out they both look pretty much the same but they're not because one's normal thread the other one's reverse thread so we've got this little sort of like washer thing in here so it's actually like two parts there's that washer or whatever you want to call it and then this is the actual crown wheel itself so that's that one out and so you can see we've got like another bridge here and that bridge is holding in the center wheel and it's also got the the barrel what the barrel is what the mainspring is inside so that's why we call this the barrel bridge so again like the train wheel bridge we've got two screws that need to come out so out they come and once again there'll be little slots there that we can use just to prise the bridge up come on out you come there it goes let's free up the other end there we are so there were like gouges on the bottom of that bridge it looks like gouges from the mainspring so that's just really odd like maybe it hasn't been sitting properly or i don't know what could have caused that but it looks like the main spring barrel had been rubbing against the bottom of the bridge so that's certainly not correct and might be part of the problems that this movement have so we take the train and wheels out now now this is the barrel that's got the mainspring inside of it so we take that out basically with those bridges off all of these parts are just sitting there so we take those out because if parts fall out it's a lot harder to work out where they go right so now we're on the motion work side and we've got this uh, little plate that uh, holds quite a few of these components of the motion work in so like the yoke which is like the lever that slides back and forth on the sliding clutch or to engage the sliding clutch and the yoke spring and also the uh, minute wheel is underneath that as well so you can't get the minute wheel out while this plate is in place so this has got to come out something a little bit unusual about this movement is that it doesn't have a um, 
a setting lever spring as such. It just kind of works on the shape of the, the setting lever and, and the, the yoke. There's like a little um, kink in it. And that's what gives you that nice positive feel back. So I think it's really cool. I think it's a fantastic design that there's no actual uh, setting lever spring. So we took the yoke and the yoke spring out without the spring flying away, which is always fraught. And out comes the minute wheel. Now we've got this little intermediate wheel, which connects the, the keyless work is what we call this section, connects the keyless work to the uh, motion work. Now this um, tool I've got, this is a Canon pinion removal tool. And this is the first time I've ever managed to get a Canon pinion out with this tool. I did try it on the stopwatch, but it didn't work uh, for, for whatever reason on, on the big watch that I did, but first time, I'm so impressed. Um, so that's the Canon pinion there, uh, which goes on the, the long um, side of the center wheel. And so this is the setting lever screw. We're pretty much getting to the end of this movement now. Out comes the setting lever screw and you might've seen the setting lever fall off underneath. There it is there. That's the setting lever. And yeah, there's almost nothing left. There's the crown and stem. And you can see the um, sliding clutch and we've got that um, last cogwheel there. And then this is um, the bottom end stone for the um, balance complete. So I'll just take that out as well. And I'm gonna pick it up just with a bit, bit of Rodico because um, it's kind of sitting in there. And, um, uh, oh, I just dropped it on the floor. My first piece on the floor. Fortunately, it's not one of the smallest ones. And yeah, I got kind of lucky because there it is just underneath the edge of the carpet. I'm sure that won't be the last part that I drop. So anyway, these screws here, I'm not sure what they are. I think they might be something to do with case screws. I'm just going to leave them there. They're not really doing anything. So we need to take the barrel apart, because especially in a watch of this age, you never know what you're going to find. Um, it's probably really good practice to actually replace the mainspring in a watch of this age. I think that certainly if you were paying to have it serviced, I think that's what you'd expect. But because this is a junk movement, I am not going to replace the um, spring. And also I really need to learn the skills on how to refit an existing spring. Um, yes, if you buy a new spring, it means that you don't need a winder. You can just pop it in there and away you go. But I think it's important to have the skill of knowing how to reinstall this existing spring. So yeah, why is this so difficult? The, the end of the arbor, that's that middle shiny bit, is kind of rounded. So it's really, really hard to grip with the tweezers. So I just can't get a grasp on it. So I'm really not sure what I'm doing wrong there. It shouldn't have been that hard to get that arbor out. But anyway, um, so this is the actual spring here. And this needs to come out as well. It's I find it so tricky. Sometimes you feel like you need to hold four or five different things all at once. So anyway, oops. Well, anyway, at least um, that shouldn't be too hard to find. And there we are. We've got all of the parts out of this movement now. So there they are sitting in my dust trays and there's the plate. And now I'm going to clean them. And I do want to try to clean these properly. Um, the, the big pocket watch that I did, it was such a basket case, it was just kind of a bit of an exercise, but this watch um, does seem to be in much better shape. So I wanna learn these skills of how to wash or clean things properly. So I've got these little um, brass cleaning baskets and I am, I'm grouping parts by where they go because I'm still kind of getting my head around, uh oh, what has happened to my balance? That's, yeah, that's anyway. We'll get back to that. That could be catastrophic. So yeah, I tend to put the parts together where they go, um, just for it's easier for me. 
And yeah, you can see what has happened here is like the end. Um, yeah, there's an end piece on the end of the spring that's fallen out of that hole. There's a little screw there that holds it in place and it's it's come loose or something and it's just, yeah, there. It's, it's just come out just in the process of me handling the spring, which is, yeah, not good, because I guess there's kind of probably a risk of damaging or kinking things as well. Uh, and if that happens, that can be the end of the watch. Um, so, yeah, I'm really not exactly sure how that happened, but anyway, we'll deal with that at some other time. So, I put my brass baskets inside of these little jam jars, and inside of the jam jars is IPA or isopropyl alcohol. So I'm going to put this into the cleaner and then I'll put water in it. So it means that I'm not filling the cleaner up with IPA. And um, look, there's various things that you can use. I'm, I'm using IPA. The thing with IPA is you cannot clean the pallet fork and you cannot clean the balance with it because uh, the stones are kind of um, connected with adhesive. They're stuck on with adhesive. And the, if the IPA were to dissolve that, then that's, you know, you don't want to be trying to glue those back on, or I certainly don't want to anyway. So I'll clean those separately using some One Dip, which is a, a specialized um, cleaner for, it's used specifically for end stones. Well, it's actually called a, a, a balance cleaner. So it's, um, yeah, specialist watchmaker solvent. So anyway, I'll give this a good clean. And while this is cleaning, can I please encourage you to subscribe to my channel? It means so much to me. And if you'd like to support more of this kind of content, I've got a Patreon. Uh, it's actually connected to my other channel, which is about hi-fi gear and a little bit of uh, nautical stuff. So you might like to go and check that one out as well. Right. So having gotten these things cleaned, it's time to start putting this movement back together. So first went in the escape wheel. You can always tell it's the escape wheel because it's got that funny shape. And this is the fourth wheel. And the way I know that this is the fourth wheel is because it's got that long extended pivot because this movement being an older movement, it doesn't have a center um, second sweep hand on, on the same pinions, if you like, as the hour and the minute hand, it, it's down below. So there's an extended pinion on the fourth wheel. The fourth wheel rotates once a minute. So that's where the second hand goes, is it takes 60 seconds for the hand to rotate. So this is the third wheel. I made myself a diagram also as to just the order, how these wheels sit with one another. And also you can see those sort of like little um, tooth, tooth pinions on the top just above the wheel. So that's sort of like how one wheel drives the next wheel and so on. So yeah, I made myself a diagram and that has made it a whole lot easier for me to, to know how to get it in. But, but gee, it's actually a lot harder than I thought to get these dinged um, things in the holes. Anyway, and that's, oh, it popped out again. Stop that. Behave. Anyway, so that's the escape wheel, the fourth wheel, and the third wheel. The center wheel is what we, we call it the center wheel, but it's actually the second wheel. And the mainspring barrel is the first wheel. But it's not called the first wheel, it's, it's called the mainspring. And the center wheel is not called the second wheel, it's called the center wheel. But those two are the first wheel and the second wheel. You think about where the power begins from or where the power starts, it starts from the mainspring, right? That's, that's what makes the watch go. So the first wheel to move is the mainspring. And then it makes the center wheel turn. Hence, it's the second wheel that receives power. Then the center wheel makes the third wheel turn, which makes the fourth wheel turn, which makes the escape wheel turn. And then that turning is controlled by 
the pallet fork, which stops the wheels from turning. And then the, the, the spring in the balance goes back and forth and controls how often that happens. For some reason, it, this looks a whole lot easier when other people do it. So, yeah, it took me ages. I'm going to have to um, pull this movement apart again and just practice this and just keep practicing it until I nail it. But to be honest, guys, a lot of the problem that I'm having is I can't really see and I'm not quite sure what to do about that. You might have some suggestions in the comments. Um, the problem is, is that I'm using my iPhone for the camera, which does a pretty good job of the macro work, but I've got to have the camera really, really close to the work and I can't use a loop because the, the focal distance of, of the loop is only, I don't know, 10 centimeters or something. So you've got to have the work 10 centimeters in front of your eyes. There's, there's no way that I can have the work there and, and the camera. I'd be like headbutting the camera. So it's, it's just impossible. I have got my Maggie lamp, which is um, pretty good. And it has got like a, a higher magnification diopter in it, is, in it as well, which helps. But again, the, the working distance is too close. So I think certainly I'm going to have to get a microscope. I've been wanting to get a microscope for, for quite some time. But I don't think that's going to be the solution to all the problems. It, it, will, it will help a lot. Um, I'll just have to see how I go. So, but yeah, this is a problem. You guys can actually see better than I can because of just the nature of where the camera is. The camera's right in front of the work and I'm not. So, you know, you're probably spotting blunders before I spot them because I just can't see. So anyway, we're going to lubricate the mainspring. And so it's Mobius 8200 is a specialized mainspring grease. It just stops the, um, the spring from binding up on itself. And this is a, a mainspring winder set that I got on eBay. So um, it's a it's a watch craft, I think. Um, unfortunately, well, it is used, and some of the some of the sizes, the hook is actually damaged or broken off. So the ideal size that I wanted to use for this spring, the hook is broken. So, but anyway, I thought that this was a better option than. You know, you pay an absolute fortune if you buy the proper Swiss ones, like you'd be over a thousand dollars easily. Um, and I just didn't quite like the look of the, the Chinese ones. So I thought that I'd go with this um, used one that I found on eBay. And yeah, it actually seems to be working quite well. The tricky part is just getting the very end inside. The whole thing has got to be inside the housing because um, otherwise you can't pop it back into the barrel. So anyway, we've got this thing wound into the housing of the winder now. So we've just got to get the end piece out without the whole thing popping out again, which would be kind of annoying. And there we go, look at that. So this is, this is the first time I've ever done this, first time I've ever used a mainspring winder. And so, yeah, I, I don't know, but I think that this is a little bit too big, this one. I think it wanted to be the size down, but that's the one that's got the broken hook on it, so I couldn't use it. So anyway, with a little bit of fiddling and with a little bit of persistence, voila, there it is. My hand was in the way, but it's actually in the housing. And I made myself a diagram to make sure it was in the right way. It's obviously you could put it in backwards if you weren't careful. And so after, again, having a lot of trouble picking up the arbor and after throwing it away on the floor and spending several hours rolling around on the floor looking for it only to find it in my top pocket of my shirt, I finally, eventually, after much frustration, got this in. But I made a real meal of it. And again, what am I doing wrong, guys? I, I don't understand why it was so difficult. And as you can see, I ended up doing the last bit off camera because it was just driving me bananas and I could not see what the heck I was doing. 
So anyway, um, so before we start putting the rest of putting the movement together, before the um, before the barrel bridge can go on, the setting lever screw needs to be in place because the setting lever screw sits underneath the barrel bridge. Now I've well, it's not really a blue, but I've I've made a bit of a blue here that I forgot. I forgot that the bridge actually holds the setting lever screw in place. And I was thinking that I needed to put the setting lever on to stop the screw from falling out. And yes, it will stop the screw from falling out, but it won't fall out once the barrel bridge is on. So anyway, no, no harm. Um, I basically would have had to do this anyway. So I used some Rodico, which is kind of like Watchmaker's Blue Tack, to hold the setting lever in place while I screwed it in from the other side. So anyway, it's in, no harm done. So in goes the mainspring barrel. Just sit that in place. And with that in place, we can then put the mainspring bridge or the barrel bridge back in place. It means we can really now start getting stuck into reassembling this movement. And again, we can see there's some little location pins there. So we've got to sit this over the top of a few things because we've got the, the barrel, the mainspring barrel, we've got the center wheel. We need to make sure they go in their right places and just sort of ease this down into place and when I'm satisfied that it's more or less in place um, I can put some screws in and not tighten it fully down until I'm certain that everything is is kind of working as it should so you would have seen that I made sure that the train wheels were able to turn because if they're not able to turn then something's fundamentally wrong and certainly the last thing you'd want to do is tighten down a bridge onto the top of a pivot because that would snap the pivot for sure. And that would be the end of that particular wheel. You'd need to be finding a new wheel. And for a watch like this, that would be mean that would mean finding another movement really because I, I don't think you're going to find, well, I don't know, but I'm just guessing that I don't think you're going to find um, new parts for this movement. So I'll just get these screws in just loosely because they're not going to go anywhere. And after having made sure that the wheels are able to move, then I can tighten this bridge down and then we'll have both bridges in place. And I did do so also for the train wheel bridge as I was tightening that down, just made sure that the wheels were able to move before um, tightening all the way down. So yeah, that's free to move. Okay, so we can put a little bit of oil now. So this is uh, Mobius D5. You can tell from the, it's kind of like got that ready slash pink color. And look, again, I'm, I'm a complete noob. And the other problem again, as I say, is I, I can't see properly. So I can't actually really see how much oil I'm applying. And it's gonna be worse when I get to the pivots. Um, these are not quite so critical, but I could tell that that was too much. So I'm just using some Rodico to blot up the excess oil. And now we put some D5 in the center wheel pivot. And I'm a, again, I'm a complete noob. Um, noobs tend to put too much oil. It's not especially a problem because this is a, this is a junk movement, but I am gonna to need to learn how to do this properly before I get into some real movements. Um, especially if it's any a movement that's got any value. So some lubrication on the end pivots. So this is um, 9010 because this is the escape wheel pivot. It rotates much faster than the center and the third wheel. So the fourth wheel also rotates, uh, as I noted before, once a minute. So it's, it's rotating quite a bit faster than the other wheels. So using some Mobius 9010 on there, and now we do the same thing on the other side, just lubricate these various uh, end stones and so on. So 
so D5. I'm actually not using D5, I'm actually using the, the synthetic version of D5. I just can't remember what it's called off the top of my head. But um, yeah, I think a synthetic version is, is going to last longer. It's the same reason why we use synthetic oils these days in, in cars. They just are much, much more stable, tend to keep their operating properties um, across a much broader and harsher range of conditions. And that's what you want, isn't it? So that's why when I saw there was a synthetic version available, I thought, oh, I'll just go for the synthetic one. Why not? So just sort of mopping up um, excess oil. So now just a little bit of D5 here. This is where the crown wheel is going to go. And incidentally, it's called the crown wheel because it's right where the crown goes. You can probably see the little hole in the side of the main plate, which is where we'll put the crown and we'll put the stem through that hole and the crown will kind of like hang just out there. So that's why it's called the crown wheel. Get in there, you. So that little washer thing, just a little bit of just a little bit of oil on here because we're going to put this uh, screw in and I'm not sure which screw is which but this one is reverse thread so basically if it doesn't screw up in the reverse thread direction then it's the wrong screw which means I'll have to switch it to the other one that kind of looks basically the same so but no there we go that seems to be, yeah, just nip that up. Yep, that is definitely reverse thread. So that is the correct screw. Okay, so now we put the ratchet wheel back in place and it's got this like square hole which engages with the the bottom of the the arbor which comes out of the mainspring barrel so this is what's going to wind up put all the power into the watch There we go. Again, just a little bit of D5 just underneath there because we're going to have that moving around. And obviously the screw head engaging with that. And so here is the click and yeah, this, I'm just not really sure what's going on here because as I mentioned before, the, the click spring, which I ended up leaving in there, looks kind of like it's mangled. Um, possibly even it looks like maybe one end of it might be broken off. It's still working, but I'm, I don't know what has happened there something just doesn't seem quite right so that's going to make it more difficult to get the click into its position just because this silly spring is yeah i don't think it's quite in the right shape so i'm just trying to get this thing how it should be So I put the click screw in just to try to kind of hold everything in place because the click itself wants to jump off the shaft and so on. So almost there, but I think the, yeah, I think the, um, the spring has 
gone underneath the um, click, which is not good. It needs to be next to the click, not underneath it. So I try again, see if we can just get this right. And this is kind of one of those points where I feel like I wish I had an extra arm because I'm wanting to hold about three or four different things all at once. Okay, now stay where you're meant to stay. Be good. Maybe if I can just get it all tightened up, it will stay in place. Is it gonna work? Maybe. But then it seems to me that the click itself is kind of flopping around. Yeah, see, that's not right. It's like it's flopping around or something. It's not, not quite down all the way. I, I don't know why that's the case. So anyway, just a little bit of lubrication there anyway, where it's going to rub. Maybe if I just try to nib it down a little bit, that'll fix it. Or maybe it won't. Oh dear. That's my first broken screw. And that's just so easy to do. I can't believe how... Yes, I was trying to nib it down, but I think I've just learnt... A really important lesson you you in watchmaking you can't nib things down there's no such thing as nibbing things down because it's just so small so yeah that is broken anyway look i'm just going to carry on i'm just going to press on so we've got this um this wheel goes in here which is the, the first wheel that engages kind of with the uh, winding stem. So just a little, yeah. I've kind of got, got way too much grease on there, but again, I'm having so much trouble seeing that you guys can actually see far better than I can how much grease is going on there. So anyway, not to worry, this is something that um, I'm sure I will refine and work on as I continue to practice, whether it be on this movement or whether I do some other junk movements, I don't quite know. Anyway, we certainly don't want grease floating around in other parts of the movement, so we clean that up. And just a little bit of D5, again, that's probably too much, but some D5 where this um, intermediate wheel is going to go. So this is the sliding clutch engages with this wheel. And now this is the winding stem, which is attached to the crown itself. So we just situate this. It is a bit trickier than it looks just because it's, it's square, but it has to be square because um, otherwise it wouldn't work. So we just get that in place. Yeah, that seems kind of right. And just a little bit of grease on this end. Okay, so some grease here on, this is the pivot of the center wheel. The cannon pinion needs to go on here. And this is, again, this is probably way too much grease again. But anyway, you gotta learn somehow, haven't you? Okay, so this is the cannon pinion. And so just on a um, staking block, just kind of force it into place 
with um, some strong tweezers. And that kind of really does need to be in place because we're going to put in um, the other parts around it. So the minute wheel is going to go there. There it is, one minute wheel. Engage it, there we go, with that little intermediate wheel. Okay, so this is the, the yoke, which kind of like sits in like a little notch in the sliding clutch and it, it slides the sliding clutch back and forth. And it skews fingers, but um, this is the yoke spring. And I'm being really, really careful here because I've spent enough time on the floor already on this watch looking for various bits and pieces. And so I need to be able to get this spring into place. Let's try using this end of my stick. Without it flying away would be really, really good. Okay, and that looks kind of about right. Just make sure that this sort of slides back and forth and it can engage with the sliding clutch. So far so good. before all of this stuff goes flying everywhere, let's get this plate back on um, because this is what holds all of these things in place and, and basically stops the, the yoke spring, um, especially in the yoke, from just disappearing. So although it doesn't actually do anything mechanically, yeah, it holds all of these pieces in place. So yeah, we can see that the keyless work mechanism seems to be working as it should. You can see the yoke going back and forth, the setting lever moving. But something doesn't seem quite right here. This just doesn't seem to want to... There's something wrong and I'm not quite sure what it is. Anyway, we just check the, again, check the yoke and the sliding clutch are engaging as they should. That seems pretty good. And yeah, again, that's that groovy little notchy feeling that like you would get with a setting lever spring, but there is no spring, which I think is really cool. And yeah. Engaging with the wheels. See the cannon pinion turning. All right, so let's put the pallet fork back in place. We've got to get the, again, get the pivot into the jewel hole, which is a whole lot harder than it sounds. I guess I'm kind of a little bit surprised, I, I shouldn't be, I know, but a little bit surprised at how specialised the fine, fine motor skills needed to do this are. Uh, I mean, my background is microelectronics and I've done a lot of surface mount soldering in my time, soldering 
circuits where the pins were less than a millimeter apart. Um, soldering really tiny resistors onto circuit boards and doing it all under a microscope um, with tweezers and a soldering iron. But this is different. It's, it's, the skills don't seem to port between them. So, um, yeah, I thought those fine motor skills from surface mount soldering would, would do me for here, but I don't think that that's the case. Anyway, so we've got the um, pallet fork bridge back in place now. Again, just making sure that the it is able to turn freely, that the pivots are in the holes. And yeah, that seems to be able to move back and forth. So once I'm sure that that is correct and the bridge is down, I'll be able to put the screw in for the bridge just to secure that. And we're kind of getting to the point where there's not much of this movement left. Only a few pieces left. There we go, that's in place. So it should be possible now to put some wind in the watch because the pallet fork is, is basically what stops. Yeah, look at that, see? Um, see how when I tap it, it jumps to the other position? So that tells me that there's wind in the watch and it's getting down. So this is uh, one dip, which is a specialized solvent. So I'm just gonna use it to, I've gotta put the balance back together because it fell apart. And so I've just got to clean it first. It's easier to clean it, I think, while it's apart. And yeah, I've got to get this um, back together, which is going to be extremely, extremely fiddly. Trying to hold it all in place with, with that end piece in its hole and trying to do this screw up with the smallest screwdriver that I have and again, not being able to see anything. And the problem with the 10 times loop is, is I've got to get so darn close to the work that I can't work on it. So yeah, I think I need that microscope. So anyway, it is finally back together. And so now we need to put the balance back in place. And again, I want to know why this looks so much easier for other people. Um, that's not supposed to happen. You know, bits, the, dropping the thing, dropping the, the, that arm with the, the balance, you know, staying there is, is not good. That's, that's an e really easy way to, to damage the spring. So it's, it's proving to be a bit of a nightmare. So I, I think honestly what I'm going to have to do uh, once this is all said and dusted is I think I'm just going to have to practice taking the balance in and out, in and out, in and out, and just keep practicing it until I'm a whole lot better at it than I am now. And this does not want to kick up for some reason. You know, I, I would have thought that the watch should want to kick up and it doesn't want to kick up. I can see the, I can see the pallet fork going back and forth, but it just doesn't want to, it doesn't want to kick up for some reason. So I'm, I'm not especially distressed about that because I went into this project of the understanding that this was a junk movement. And so it's not so much about having a working movement, it's about being able to pull it apart and put it back together again. But as you saw at the beginning, the thing started running. So it would be kind of nice if after I've put it back together, it's, it's running again. But at the moment, it doesn't look like it wants to run. But anyway, I guess I shouldn't really expect my first enterprise into um, 
doing a wristwatch to not be without its problems. So yeah, we'll have another go. And the other little problem too is, is that when this all fell apart, there's a couple of little regulator pins. I haven't actually put it back on yet. You'll be able to see, I haven't got the end stones in either. Um, but because the regulator pins were disengaged, those have to be re-engaged. And I really can't do that without magnification, without a microscope. So um, it won't be possible to regulate this movement. It shouldn't stop it from running though. And yeah, it just does not want to kick up. Just kind of frustrating. And yes, guys, I know I could edit all of this out, but part of the whole point of this is so that you can feel my pain, but I think also to have a realistic idea of what's involved in this. You know, I, I think it's very easy to watch other people's vi videos and think that things are a whole lot easier than they really are. And, you know, I've decided to, to dive in and have a bit of a go at watchmaking, but I think it's important to have a, a realistic idea as to you know, what's actually involved before you do kind of dive into the deep end, so to speak. Um, so I know I'm kind of like at the very beginning, but that's why I decided to start this channel, was so that people could see what it's like for someone who's never done this before and see what the kind of things are that, that you might go through if you decide to give it a go, I'm not trying to put you off. I think it's it's a wonderful hobby. It's why I decided to give it a go and why I enjoy watching other people's videos. But I think it's important too to have some reality as to you know the challenges that one faces. So I think that I have got this balance where it is meant to be, but the watch is not running. So something is something is wrong. It's like it's like there's not enough power to actually make the mainspring oscillate, which could be because of a problem with the hairspring itself, or it could be something else. I don't know. But anyway, I'm going to continue with putting this thing back together. So we put the hour wheel back on now. So that's the last part of the motion work. Now, it something is wrong. Because you can see that it's not sitting down properly. It's like something is holding it up. And the only thing that could possibly be holding it up is a cannon pinion. So... I think that I do not have the Canon pinion actually all the way home, all the way down. And so that is going to need to be resolved before I can put the hour wheel into place. Yeah, the way, see the way it's sitting up, that's just not, that's just not right.
So hopefully if I just give it a good push again with the the strong tweezers, skews fingers. Yeah, there we go. Right, so I got that done and um, sorry for doing that last bit off camera, but um, yeah, so that problem's resolved. So now we just need to put the dial back on as we have done and then we put the the dial spring the dial screws went back in, those two little screws, and now the hands go on. And we basically just push the hands on like so. There we go. It's actually pretty satisfying, you know. And the minute hand. There we go, and just make sure that that kind of seems to work. So here ends my first ever attempt to tear down and reassemble a wristwatch movement. To be honest, I'm not really sure what to think. I guess I'm pleased that I got it back together, but we had a number of disasters and it was running when I took it apart and it is not running now. Uh, so basically you can see that the balance starts to spin but it does not keep spinning. Um, but the amount of times that I dropped the balance and also remember it fell apart as well, I've probably damaged the balance and part of the issue I have is I don't really have the magnification I need or I certainly can't do magnification and camera at the same time. It's even hard enough to do magnification and get the light in, so I think I really need a microscope. Um, but it's clear that I'm going to have to do some practice on removing and refitting a balance. Um, the other disaster I had is that I sheared off the top of the click screw, which you can't see now because it's underneath the face, but yeah, the head of the click screw I sheared off. Everything is sort of still sitting in position, so it does actually... I can actually wind it, but it's it's full of wind at the moment because it's not running. Um, so, yeah, I guess it kind of demonstrates to me that I've got a lot further to go than I thought. Even though with my electronics background, you know, I've done a lot of fine work, fine soldering. I need to do a lot more practice in fine motor skills and just handling the screwdrivers, handling the tweezers. Uh, it's all very very tricky so yeah that's where we're at um, I think it would be foolish at this point for me to try to uh, repair a movement because I quite clearly don't have the skills I need just yet I, I have got a couple of movements over there watches that I want to repair but I think if I tried to do those now I would probably end up breaking them so I'm going to need to get hold of um, ideally a, a junk movement with a working balance and just practice on the balance and probably do some more practice on train wheel bridges and so on. So anyway, that's where we're at. If you've got some comments, I'd love to hear them on um, tips and tricks that might help me. Bearing in mind, please be gentle. This is my first time. And um, yeah, if you want to follow along my watchmaking journey, please do subscribe to my channel. I hope you enjoyed this video. Hopefully you didn't find it too frustrating. It's all part of the learning journey. Give me a like and I look forward to seeing you on the next video. And watch out.